So what someone was asking, what's, what's been happening with participation? So I will, I will give you a, um, if you turn your seat to the media. There have been, there have been many, many streams of participation um, over the past years. But the, the, the origin of one stream, which is the RRA, PRA one, which is the was disillusioned, disillusioned with questionnaires because in the past they were not as good as they are now. Computers have made it much faster. Things went very long and slow. And disillusioned with social anthropology because it took a hell of a long time for social anthropologists to say that they needed another six months before they could give an answer. And so these, through frustration, they led to rapid rural appraisal. And rapid rural appraisal was what people were actually doing in order to find out fast. But it was not respectable. Um, and it included things like transects. Uh, some of you have um, written up to you some experience of transects. Who, who, who has done a transect? No. Um, am I being intimidating? <laughs> I mean, there, there were some, yes, have managed transects. Two people. Know a bit about two people. Never mind. Transects. Uh, Rapid roller places. The idea of walking through an area systematically and observing things as you go. So it was really to do with observation. Uh, <coughs> that was one of the bits in RRA. Diagramming, going to a community and drawing a map of that community, um, interviewing people and making seasonal diagrams. These were all part of RRA. Gordon Conway uh, was very much involved in developing this with colleagues in Thailand in the, in the 60s. So RRA was an improvement because it was much faster than these. But we did it. We did the diagrams. But what happened then was that there were some scales from the eyes experiences. And it led to PRA which is participatory rural appraisal, which was based on these two, these two slogans were fundamentally clear. People themselves could make maps. And it may seem amazing to you now, but as late as 1989, we, the development community, did not know that people could make maps. We thought we had to make the maps. And it could be really embarrassing. I, I was involved in, in trying to make a sketch map over two days in a village in the Sudan, and then we showed it to the people. And, um, and they looked at it, and they were kind of embarrassed to tell us how bad it was. Um, he said, "You've only got one bakery, but we've got three, and things like and things like that." And we gradually realised that we were not the, the best people to make maps. But if people themselves made maps, I spent I spent two days trying to map the wells in a village in Tamil Nadu. And at the end of the two days, I failed. Later, towards the end of 1989, in Andhra Pradesh, a group of us were in the community. We asked the farmers to make a map. And in 25 minutes, they made a map which showed all their wells and showed which ones were working well and which ones were not. <coughs> 25 minutes, as against a failure over two days. <laughs> and I just thought, what a bloody idiot. <laughs> I've been all these years not realizing that people could do it. 
and could do it so much better and actually enjoy it and learn from it themselves. Because when people themselves do a diagram, they see things in a way which they didn't before. Um, how many of how many of <coughs> us have got children? Right. Well, what I would suggest to you, I don't know how old, have you got children over the age of about four? Yes, yes, there's some heads nodding. Well, <coughs> I'm, I don't know, four maybe, I mean, maybe, um, maybe it's three, I don't know, or less. Um, <coughs> when you go home, try this. Yourself, make a map of your environment around your home. And then ask your children to do the same thing. Of course, it depends on how free they are to move and all the rest of it. But I live in a village not far from here. And when our children drew maps, they were so much more detailed than the maps which either Jenny or myself could draw. They had a far greater knowledge. And this was another case of they could do it because it was, it was their environment. But also, you learn and they learn what's important for them because young children will draw the playground much bigger than anything else. <laughs> so when you, go, when you go home with your children, do have a go at this and see what happens. Uh, but do your own as well. And then let them see how inadequate yours is. <laughs> or maybe yours will be better, I don't know. <coughs> so this is what happened. The discovery that people could do their own analysis and so all the who, who's questions became much more answered by, by theirs that they could do it. And it was just, I have to say, because I was living through this, because I was with other people who were innovating, it was an absolutely thrilling time to be alive, just as it's thrilling now, <coughs> but for different reasons, because again and again we were finding that people could do things which we didn't think they could. So having that confidence, but also another thing that we learned from the PRA, I will call it ABC. And this is attitude and behavior change. That it was our, not their attitudes. In the past, it been, you know, these, these people are conservative, they're lazy, they need educating, they need teaching, you know, all, all that old sort of colonial stuff. No, we need to change our attitudes and behavior and to become facilitators, conveners and facilitators. And on the table, you'll find a photocopy of the introduction of a journal which has come out this month, no, in May, the Journal of Knowledge Management for Development, which is on facilitation. And I've only just printed it out, but it looks to me to be very, very good about facilitation. So if you're interested in facilitation, mark up that you would like a photocopy of this bit of the introduction, which also tells you how you can Google and get the whole thing. So facilitation and attitude behavior. Now, where we are now, is a very different. In the 1990s, people would say, we do PRA, or we do appreciative inquiry, or we do planning for real, or we do something or other. But that has all changed now. We're in a very different space in which people inventively combine different approaches and methods. In other words, it's like cooking, where you have a a tremendous expansion of the number of ingredients that you can put into dishes. So you can be creative each time, and each time produce something different for the particular context. Although I know um, those of us who struggle to cook uh, tend to reproduce the things that we know are fairly safe. <coughs> so what we've got now is we've got, we've got a whole mass of, of different approaches and methods, some of which are listed up there, which can be combined in different ways. And I have to say, ActionAid has been extraordinarily inventive 
in creating new methods, particularly around issues of power mm -hmm. and powerlessness. And <coughs> the, um, I'm not sure I haven't been to your website for some time, but I, I suspect that the ActionAid website would be one good source, but also PLAN and others. Um, many, many innovations. And so when we start thinking about participatory statistics, it isn't a standard method like an RCT. It puts much more responsibility on <coughs> the facilitator, the initiator, the manager than before. And some people don't like that. They would much rather have a, this with the questionnaire. It's a personal choice. It's an institutional choice. And we'll come back to that.